I wanted to share with you, before we started a little bit, as I have in the past, something that I read this morning. I happen to be uh, going through some Proverbs. Proverbs was written by Solomon, the son of King David, who became king and becoming king, Solomon asked God for wisdom and knowledge, and God granted that to him. Solomon, therefore, was compelled to write down a lot of his wisdom and the knowledge that he had and pass it on to his sons and to everyone else, and thus we have the book of Proverbs. So it's a little confusing sometimes when you read through this because a lot of times it sounds like God is actually speaking to us. And in a lot of senses, that is correct because God is speaking through Solomon and giving us this wisdom. But I'd like to share with you just a little bit from Proverbs 8 where Solomon writes, Now children, listen to me. Happy are those who keep my ways. Listen to instruction and be wise. Don't avoid it. Happy are those who listen to me watching daily at my doors and waiting at my doorposts. Those who find me find life. They gain favor from the Lord. His instruction to us is pay attention to what he has learned <clears throat> and follow through with that wisdom and be conscious of God being with us all the time and helping us to understand what we need to understand. Welcome to worship. Both those of you who are gathered in this sanctuary and those worshiping with us online, we are so glad that you have joined us to hear God's word and to offer ourselves to God's service. Today is Pentecost, often referred to as the birthday of the church. You may have noticed that the pyramids on the altar and the pulpit are red. You may have responded to our invitation to wear red for Pentecost today. <clears throat> Pentecost was a Jewish festival better known as the Festival of Weeks, or Shavuot. Uh, on the first Pentecost celebration after Jesus' resurrection, the Holy Spirit filled the disciples and tongues that looked like flames appeared above their heads. Because Pastor Lorenda and Steve and Ginger are at annual conference this Sunday, we have a guest preacher, Reverend Richard Francis. We're glad to have you here. Whoever you are, wherever you are, whether you are wearing red today or wearing some other colors, know that you are welcome here among the gathering of God's spirit-filled people seeking to follow Jesus. As we continue our worship I invite you to join with me in taking three slow, deep breaths to center ourselves and become aware of the presence of the Holy Spirit. Let's continue together in our bulletin by uh, responding with the greeting. Come, Holy Spirit, breathe on us. Come, Holy Spirit, set our hearts on fire. Let us pray together. Holy God, who comes to us in breath, visits us from the throne of heaven, and sets us aflame with amazement and joy. You open our paths to new visions and guide our feet deeper into our wisdom. Give us faith to trust your presence through Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please stand if you're able and join together in singing the hymn, Come Thou Mighty King, found on page 81, or 61, excuse me, I misread that. 61? Yeah.
Uh, well, as you've heard, my name is Richard Francis. I'm a retired Presbyterian minister. I live in Carroll. Uh, my wife Kathy came with me today, so she's back there. And um, most recently, I served the churches in Vail and Westside uh, before retiring a few years ago. So I'm uh, happy to be able to be with you today. Let's join together in prayer. Holy God, we give you thanks and praise for this new day. For the warmth of sun, for the beauty of growing things all around us, for the fellowship that we enjoy in this church and among our friends, for the human life that we share with all the world around us. You have brought this world into being and you have called it good and you have given it to us to tend and to keep and we pray that we might be good stewards of this earth for as long as we live to pass it on to the next generation. We thank you for beautiful days that we can rejoice in. We thank you for stormy days that where we know your presence walking with us. We ask you to be with all those who are experiencing their own stormy days. We pray especially for communities that have known violence in recent days and weeks. We pray for strength for the survivors and for all those who will be now coping with the aftermath of those tragedies. We ask wisdom for our leaders to lead in the right direction in all these issues. And we ask wisdom for our leaders, not only in situations in this country, but in situations around the world. And so we pray not only for our nation, but for the nations of the world. Lifting up especially today the people of Ukraine, asking that there might be peace there. And so we pray for all leaders who work for peace, that you would strengthen them and give them wisdom and insight. We pray for leaders that are working for war and pray for change of heart and mind. And we pray most of all that wars might come to an end and that peace might come in places where there is suffering. We pray too for nations where there is suffering for other reasons. Where there is poverty, we pray for relief. Where there are natural disasters, we pray for recovery. Where there is oppression, we pray for freedom. Most of all, O oh God, we pray for your presence in all the hard places of the world and in the hard places of our hearts. We pray for our church, for its fellowship, for its ministry, for its outreach, for its connection to other churches. We give you thanks that as we worship together, we are connected by invisible bonds to worshipers all around the world. And so we pray for your church wherever it's found, in small, church, in small towns and in cities, in great cathedrals and in storefronts and homes. We give you thanks that churches can worship freely and we pray for those churches who must worship in secret. That your spirit might be with all of us to spread the good news in all the ways available to us. Oh God, we ask you to be with those individuals that we have seen named and for those whom we name in our hearts before you. We ask for safety for travelers. We give you thanks for families able to gather. We pray for those who have suffered loss. We ask healing for the sick, comfort for the dying, guidance for the perplexed. And in all things, 
May we offer our prayers to you through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our first scripture reading, uh, reproduced in an insert in your bulletin, is from the Gospel of John. The 14th chapter. And this, as I guess there's a little heading on this, but this actually takes us back to the time before Easter, as Jesus is gathered with his disciples in an upper room and is giving them their last teaching and encouragement and uh, sharing with them all that they need to know. And so we pick it up uh, with Philip's question at verse 8. Hear the word of God. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father. That will be enough for us. Jesus replied, don't you know me, Philip, even after I have been with you all this time? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Don't you believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I have spoken to you, I don't speak on my own. The Father who dwells in me does his works. Trust me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me, or at least believe on account of the works themselves. I assure you that whoever believes in me will do greater works than these because I am going to the Father. I will do whatever you ask in my name so that the Father can be glorified in the Son. When you ask me for anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. I will ask the Father, and he will send another companion, who will be with you forever. This companion is the Spirit of Truth, whom the world can't receive, because it neither sees him nor recognizes him. You know him, because he lives with you and will be with you. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please remain seated as we sing, Spirit of God, Descend Upon My Heart, hymn number 500.
Our second reading is from the book of Acts, the second chapter, beginning with the first verse. Hear the word of God. When Pentecost Day arrived, the disciples were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound from heaven, like the howling of a fierce wind, filled the entire house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be individual flames of fire alighting on each one of them. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit enabled them to speak. There were pious Jews from every nation under heaven, living in Jerusalem. When they heard this sound, a crowd gathered. They were mystified because everyone heard them speaking in their native languages. They were surprised and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all the people who are speaking Galileans, every one of them? How then can each of us hear them speaking in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, as well as residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the regions of Libya bordering Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs. We hear them declaring the mighty works of God in our own languages. They were all surprised and bewildered. Some asked each other, what does this mean? Others jeered at them, saying, they're full of new wine. Peter stood with the other eleven apostles. He raised his voice and declared, Judeans and everyone living in Jerusalem, know this, listen carefully to my words. These people aren't drunk, as you suppose. After all, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. Rather, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young will see visions. Your elders will dream dreams. Even upon my spirits, men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. I will cause wonders to occur in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be changed into darkness, and the moon will be changed into blood, before the great and spectacular day of the Lord comes. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you please pray with me? May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Vaughn Smith speaks eight languages fluently. English, Spanish, Bulgarian, Czech, Portuguese, Romanian, Russian, and Slovak. But that's only the beginning. Smith is familiar with 37 more languages. With at least 24, he speaks well enough to carry on lengthy conversations. He can read and write in eight alphabets and scripts. He can tell stories in Italian and Finnish and American Sign Language. He's teaching himself indigenous languages from Mexi Mexicans Mexico's Nuatl to Montana's Salish. The quality of his accents in Dutch and Catalan dazzle people from the Netherlands and Spain. So what would you guess Vaughn Smith's profession is? A professional translator? That'd be a pretty good guess. Maybe he's a professor of linguistics or a career diplomat. No, actually Vaughn Smith is a 46-year-old carpet cleaner who lives in Washington, D.C., where, by the way, he has ample opportunity to practice his amazing linguistic skills with the incredibly diverse population of that city. And that is what drives Vaughn Smith to learn all these languages. I'm sure that there are people, they are known as hyperpolyglots, by the way, I just learned, who uh, can speak multiple languages. Many of those folks do it, I think, as an intellectual exercise. Let me see how many languages I can learn before I die. But what drives him is the desire to communicate. Whenever he hears someone speaking a language he doesn't know, he wants to learn that language so he can talk to them. To make a human connection, to know something about another person, that might be a person who might be very different from yourself, but is still a person with all that being a person implies. Love, hope, fears, and a future. As soon as I read this story about Vaughn Smith, which appeared in the Oregonian newspaper, I thought of the day of Pentecost. Because the story of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is a story of communication. 
It starts in the first chapter of Acts, actually, with Jesus' disciples questioning Jesus about his plans. Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel now? To the disciples, that seemed like the logical next step. Jesus had been arrested, tried, and crucified, destroying all the disciples' hopes and expectations. Then, to their joy and astonishment, Jesus had been raised from the dead and restored to them. Surely, the next thing Jesus would do would be to bring in the kingdom as he had promised. But Jesus, it turns out, has other plans. It isn't for you to know the times or seasons that the Father has set by his own authority, Jesus said. Rather, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the end of the earth. You will receive power. You will be my witnesses. Those are Jesus' two promises to his followers, not just those who were gathered there at that moment, but to all his followers ever since. You will receive power, said Jesus. You won't do the things I call you to do on your own strength or ability or wisdom. You will do what I call you to do by God's power. You will be my witnesses, said Jesus. You will tell other people what you have seen and heard, and everything I've said and done you will remember and pass on. That's the background to our passage today. That was promise. This is fulfillment. Jesus promised power. And power came in the form of a howling wind and tongues of flame. Most of all, power came in the form of the ability to speak God's message in all the languages of the known world. Reading the second chapter of Acts, we're tempted to focus on the signs because that's something that's outside of our experience, or at least most of our experiences. The rushing wind, the tongues of fire, the miraculous ability to suddenly be able to speak a language that you have never learned. But those aren't the most important features of the story. They're there to prepare the way for Peter and the other followers of Jesus to begin their work of being witnesses. And we have that power today. Never forget as you read this that although it's Peter who preaches the sermon, who relates the giving of the Spirit to the prophecies of the Old Testament prophet Joel, Peter is not alone. There are the rest of the apostles and the other followers of Jesus, both men and women, who together make up the group of 120 followers that are mentioned specifically in the first chapter of Acts. The Holy Spirit came upon all of them, and all of them received the ability to speak the language of their hearers. When you look at who those hearers were, it's a pretty impressive list. If you were to get the map of the Eastern Roman Empire as it was in the first century, with all the place names as they existed then, you would find the place names pretty much cover the whole area. And if you follow the list, you will find that it begins in the east with Parthia, Medea, and Elam, modern-day Iraq and Iran, then moving west through Judea to Asia Minor, then south to Egypt and Libya, two nations that still exist, then west to Rome, then back to Arabia. All these had their own languages and their own cultures. But they were united by one thing when they came to Jerusalem for the day of Pentecost. They were all Jews, either by birth or by conversion. So they were prepared to hear about the mighty acts of God. They had read about them in their scriptures their whole lives. What they weren't prepared for was to experience the mighty acts of God right there in front of them. No wonder they begin to ask themselves, what does this mean? And no wonder, as well, that the skeptics and cynics in the crowd, and there are always skeptics and cynics in the crowd, no wonder that they said, it's only the booze talking. No, Peter said, it's not the booze talking. This is the gift of God, and it's for you. Your sons and daughters, your young and your old, your servants, men and women. In ancient Israel, God gave the Holy Spirit to individuals mostly to kings and to prophets to equip them to do some specific task, to lead an army or to speak to a king and to speak truth to power. 
But the prophet Joel looked ahead to a time when God would pour out God's Spirit on all people, not just the chosen few. And that Spirit would enable everyone, from high to low, from the throne room to the servants' quarters, to speak God's message. You know about that, Peter said to the crowd, because you've read your Bible. You have read that Joel said it would happen in the last days. Well, these are the last days because God has raised Jesus from the dead. Jesus has been raised from the dead, Peter said, and we are witnesses. Witnesses to God's glory. Witnesses to God's power. Witnesses to God's love. And we are that same kind of witness here today. When you read through the book of Acts, one of the things that comes up over and over again is how the followers of Jesus were all together. They were all together in prayer between Jesus' ascension and the day of Pentecost. They were all together for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. At the end of this chapter, Luke tells us that day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. I think that's why the Apostle Paul came to refer to the church as the body of Christ. We are who we are in company with everyone else. It doesn't mean that there won't be disagreements, that we won't misunderstand how we should be together, and there are stories of those disagreements and how they were resolved in Acts as well. But that doesn't mean that we don't need each other. When John Wesley was a young man, an older believer said to him, Sir, you wish to be a Christian and go to heaven? Then you must either find companions or make them, for the scriptures know nothing of solitary religion. That's why I believe that as the church, we continue to have the ability to declare the mighty acts of God in all the languages of the world. And this is one of the things that gives me so much hope as a Christian and as a church leader, that I'm part of a worldwide movement. I don't speak Nahuatl, but there is a Christian somewhere in Mexico who speaks Nahuatl who right now is standing up before a congregation preaching the gospel in that language and people are hearing it. I don't speak Lao, but there are Laotian Christians who are preaching the gospel and bearing witness to the good news of Jesus Christ. And we support all these folks whenever we pray because we pray together. And also, I believe that we declare the mighty acts of God when we take a genuine interest in another person and do it without any ulterior motive, even the motive of conversion. I think that's an act of faith because we are doing our best to see the image of God in that other person, whether it's an older person in a nursing home or a child in a preschool. We are trying to let that God image come through more clearly than anything else we might see when we look at that person. That's what I found most moving about that story of Vaughn Smith, the man I introduced you to at the beginning of this message. Vaughn Smith learned to communicate in those 37 languages and even more because he wants to be able to converse with everyone he meets, no matter what language they speak. He wants to be able to communicate with other people in their own language because he sees everyone he meets as someone worth knowing, someone with a story. And I believe that that's the way that Jesus looked at other people. I believe that Jesus saw everyone he encountered as a child of God, worthy of love and worthy of salvation. Even when Jesus took people to task, as he did with the scribes and the Pharisees, sometimes in very strong language, Jesus did it because he knew that the scribes and the Pharisees were capable of more faithful obedience to God. He knew that they wanted to be faithful to God. And he wanted them to be faithful in much larger and more loving ways. Jesus never dismissed or discarded anyone Even at the moment of his death, Jesus asked forgiveness on his executioners. It's Jesus who we are called to follow and to copy. 
in the end, the story of Pentecost is about Jesus. It was Jesus who called the disciples together. Jesus who nurtured their faith. Jesus who gave them their marching orders. It was Jesus who told them, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses. And when Peter came to the climax of his sermon, it was to call his hearers to faith in Jesus. Therefore, Peter said, let the entire house of Israel know with certainty that God has made him both Lord and Messiah, this Jesus whom you crucified. When we look at the story of Pentecost, the birthday of the church, we tend to focus on the surprising things that haven't been seen or heard since. The rush of the mighty wind, the tongues of flame, the miraculous gift of tongues. But those aren't the most important things in the story. The most important thing in the story is something that continues to this day, the witness of believers, of the witness of the followers of Jesus to the good news that is for all people everywhere. What the gift of tongues is about in the second chapter of Acts is God's gift to the church. It is together that we have the power to speak God's message in all the languages of the world. It is together that we are witnesses in our own communities and to the ends of the earth. It is together that we are the body of Christ, the visible presence of God in the world and in this place right here. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. Please pray with me. Without your power, O oh God, we are lost. We have done things that and what we do desire we have not done. By your purifying fire, transform our lives. Guide us into honesty and compassion, so that filled with your peace, our dreams and visions may be one with yours. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved by the power in whom we live and move and have our being. I pronounce to you the complete forgiveness of all your sins through the, through the Holy Trinity, one God whose mercy is everlasting. Amen. Because God first loved us, we are made to love one another. For the sake of the life of the world, we offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions as signs of love. Let us join together for the singing of the doxology found on page 94. Thank you again for joining us for worship. We hope that God has touched your heart this day. Please join us next week, which will be Pastor Lorinda's final Sunday in the pulpit and her final working day. She is not retiring. She is going to work with another con with other congregations. So that's kind of a, you know kind of a miss thing. In the meantime, <clears throat> before uh, Pastor Ben comes to join us, we have people who are going to uh, fill in for us. Uh, people of our congregations to share their thoughts and, uh, and, and some of their favorite verses. So uh, keep coming. It ain't the end. We continue on. And of course, we'll enjoy uh, Pastor Ben and, and getting to know him and letting him know what's going on. Love the commandments. Keep them. Honor them. Do right by your neighbors and listen to the Spirit. Now may the Advocate the Holy Spirit guide you in the ways of God. 
and fill you with the peace that only Christ can give. Let's sing together 393 as we go forth. Oh, that's true. Have fun, guys. <laughs>